Hello everyone and welcome to this new video on mask tools for Blender. Uh, version 1.6 was just released and there are a ton of new features so this video might run a little long. The first thing I'd like to mention is that this new version of mask tools takes advantage of a lot of new features in Blender. Therefore it will only work in newer versions of Blender, so the 2.9 series and on. However, if you prefer using older versions of Blender, then the previous version of Mask Tools will remain available on the Blender market. And as I've said, there's a lot to discuss here. And if you don't know what Mask Tools is, hopefully this video will serve as a good representation of how it can be used. But before we get into it, let's talk about how to install the add-on. The file that you download from the Blender market will first need to be unzipped. Inside you'll find three separate files, the first of which is the add-on itself, which needs to stay zipped when you install it. Once you've successfully done that, you'll notice in the info there's a warning that says some features will not display properly in Eevee. This is referring solely to the Edge Detect Mask, which currently can only be used in Cycles. However, this can really easily be baked out into a texture to be used in Eevee. Once the add-on is installed, you'll find it in the Shader Editor. So if we open our shader editor and look in the side panel, we'll notice that there's this tab at the bottom that says mask tools. Here you'll find all of the options. Next, you'll find a blend file, which is just a demo of how the add-on can be used to texture a model. And finally, we have a folder full of brushes and textures that can be used in your projects. And just as a quick tip, if you enable the import brush set add-on, and then you go to file, import, brush set. Here you can select all of the brushes or textures that you want to use and click import. Then when you go to your texture painting settings, under texture, you'll have all of those brushes available to you. And one last add-on that speeds up the workflow in Mask Tools is the Node Wrangler add-on. So I highly recommend that you enable that as well. Let's first talk about what a mask is for those of you who are new to computer graphics and may not know. Here I have a mix RGB node, and I'm setting two separate colors to the color inputs. And with a factor, you can switch between the two. Now let's add something like a Musgrave texture, which is basically just values of black and white. If we add this to the factor, what's happening is that the first color is being assigned to the black, and the second color is being assigned to the white. Well, Mask Tools works very similarly. Let's begin by discussing the mask base node, which is the node that you'll likely use the most in the add-on. Here we have two sets of inputs for PBR textures, which are color, metallic, roughness, normal, and displacement. And those can be separated by a mask, which again are just values of black and white. And now we can take the corresponding outputs of that node and plug them into the inputs on a new mask base node, which works as a layering system. Next, we can add another set of PBR textures to the bottom inputs and separate that either with another texture mask or one of Mask Tool's many procedural masks. Now, we're not going to cover a lot of the procedural masks in this video because it would take quite a lot of time, but it's basically just a very quick way of adding things like edge wear or dust effects or procedural grunge to your models. But once you're finished layering all of your various materials and effects, you can then plug all of that into either a principled shader or the new material shader that comes with mask tools. And we can think of this shader as sort of a post-processing filter because it takes in all of the basic inputs, like all the PBR textures, but then it also allows you to add really quick effects like emission or here we can paint alpha. There's also controls for displacement and things that otherwise might take a little more setup, like we can really quickly add things like ambient occlusion. And to make things even more convenient, there's a preset option that has several mask-based nodes already connected and then plugged into a material shader. Now let's do a quick tutorial for the mask-based node. We'll start with a very simple object and turn it into a complex object and apply these textures to it to give it this final result. Here in Blender, I have my simple object. I'm going to turn off overlays and go into rendered view. And here I have some HDRI lighting applied to the scene. Down below, I have a file browser with all the textures that I'm going to use. And here I have mask tools open. So by default, it's set to the mask base node, but I want to select this preset option that includes the material shader. So if I click on the preset and then I click add shader. I can now delete the principled shader because we no longer need it. 
I can control shift click on the material shader which applies it to the model. Now in this string of nodes, I want to go to the very first mask base node. Here I can start dragging the first set of PBR textures directly from the file browser into the shader editor. Notice that all of the textures with the exception of the color or albedo texture is set to non-color data. Now because I've enabled Node Wrangler, I can use Ctrl T to add a mapping and texture coordinate node. This allows me to scale the size of that texture. And by the way, this set of PBR textures was downloaded from textures.com, but of course you can use whatever texture site you prefer. And in this new version of Mask Tools, now we have some preset materials that we can add. There are seven in total. There are three dielectric materials that have various types of surfaces. And then there are four different types of metal presets, all of which have a variety of ways of customizing their appearance. But I'm going to add this dielectric one material. And whenever you add a new material or node, it will always appear to the right of the material output. But we can drag it over and connect it to the second set of inputs on that mask base node. And now I'll type Shift A and add an image texture. And this will serve as our mask. I'll call this Shield Paint and click OK. Now I'll plug it into the mask input and then go to the texture paint settings. Again, I'll go into rendered view and turn off the overlays. Now you want to make sure that you're painting on the correct texture and that you're painting in a value of white, although you can paint in values of gray to blend the two different PBR materials together. And then I'll select my brush texture. Under mapping, switch it from tiled to view plane and then check that little random box. This will allow the brush to rotate randomly as I paint. And as I paint, you can see that mask being applied in the image editor. But I also want to have access to my shader editor so that we have the ability to customize these, these nodes, or rather the effect the nodes have on the texture. So we have the option to change the color. We can affect the color variation. So if I slide this all the way down, it just becomes one solid color. We have some control over the roughness. So you can determine how glossy you want your material to be. The AO slider can darken some of the lower points of the texture, which is basically just a way of faking some ambient occlusion. And then finally, we can scale those textures. And this is really the number one benefit of painting with masks, is that it still allows you to scale and rotate and change the color of your textures. But I'm going to just set this to white for now. And let's take a look at some of the options on the mask base node. Now, it may seem like a lot, but it's really quite simple. So we'll go through each of them. And the first thing that I'd like to do is I want to reveal some of that normal map from the wood plank texture through that paint. So I can just slide the normal blend up. Now this isn't a particularly strong normal map, so let's do this example on something that has a, a much stronger normal map like this brick texture. Now if I use the normal blend, you'll see that it blends between those two normal maps, and you can control the strength of that with the slider. Now I can use the contrast overlay and the adjust overlay slider to remove all of the darkest parts of that wood texture. And this allows me to create this sort of old, worn, painted wood effect. And remember, with masks, while painting white will add the new material. If you paint with black, it will act as an eraser. Now, the contrast overlay setting can also be inverted with the invert overlay setting. Now, this is for textures that have a lighter low point than their high point, such as this brick. So now we can create some old worn paint effects on this as well. And once you're finished painting your first layer, you want to make sure that you save your texture. Now we can go back to the mask base preset. And you can see that all of this uh, texture information is being inputted into the next mask base node. Now I can select another material. In this case, I'm going to choose steel. And I'll bring it over to the second mask base node. Here I'm just connecting the inputs. And now I need to create a new mask. So I'll type Shift A and add an image texture. And I'll just call this Shield Metal. And I'm going to make this texture considerably larger and also check this little box that says 32 bit float. This is because I'll be adding some bump detail to this layer, and that will help to improve that detail. Okay, so I want to X out this brush and just use the default brush, although I want to change the fall off to the second option, which is this nice round shape. Now I'll just find the center of the shield and paint just one single little dot. Okay, 
So now if I go to the shader editor and look at the mask base node that we're working on, if I add bump detail, you can see that there's a problem. So let's look at the mask. If the wood is being assigned to the black and the metal is being assigned to the white, then these values of gray are going to blend the two. So if we go back to the mask base node, we can see that we have this mask blend slider. This will completely separate all the PBR textures, but still preserve that bump detail. So now that that problem solved, I can keep painting. I'm going to turn on some symmetry, the X, Y, and the Z, and I can now quickly paint this edge around the whole shield. And before I go any further, I might just fine tune the appearance of this metal. So I can go to that metal shader and just change the color value, the roughness, and the scale if I wish. Uh, also, all of the inputs aside from the color input are already set to non-color data. So it sort of takes that step out and saves you a little bit of time when adding materials. Okay, so I'm pleased with these settings, but now I want to add some really interesting detail to the shield. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to download some textures from textures.com. Under the 3D ornaments section, there's everything from Mesopotamian to Egyptian to Victorian. So I've selected a few textures and now I'm going to apply them with a stencil. And in my texture painting settings, I can go down to texture and change the mapping type to stencil. And then now that stencil will appear in the viewport. I can right click to drag it and then shift right click to scale it. Here I'm just doing my best to center it. Uh, but one thing before I paint that mask, I want to switch the blend type from mix to add because remember, values of black might accidentally erase parts of that mask. So now I'll just paint that detail onto the shield. And remember, this only works because we're using the mask blend, right? So it's still preserving that bump detail while giving you that crisp, uh, hard edge around the mask. Okay, so now I'll open that second texture that I downloaded. And this time I want to turn on some symmetry. So first I'll start with Z and I'll move this to the top. And now if I paint this on the top, it should add it to the bottom of the shield as well. Okay, and now I can use control and right click to rotate this brush set it to the side, change the symmetry from Z to X, and now it should paint it on both uh, sides of the X axis as well. Okay, so we've covered the bump mapping and various paint effects. Uh, there's still quite a few options left that we can cover. Uh, because we have mask blend turned on, we can use this uh, add mask value slider. So when you do this, you'll notice some, uh, some slight changes happening to that metal texture. So what it's doing is it's ignoring the black value, it's ignoring the white value, but it's just adding the values in between. So what you ultimately get is sort of a, uh, some shading that represents the curvature of that bump. And it may be a little difficult to see here because that material is metallic, uh, but it really does give a very nice result. Now let's briefly talk about the smear tool or the smear brush. Uh, I'll select this really sharp curve for the brush and I'll lower the strength and I'm just going to drag it up through that metal mask. And this results in some, what feels like sculpting detail. So I'm just creating these little chips and scratches uh, just by dragging that mask inward. Uh, and this is especially useful for such as like the hard edge of the bump. So let me change my uh, brush back to something softer. And you can see on this hard ridge, I can just sculpt this detail in. And this is all just from smearing around those values. Okay, so our shield is looking pretty good. Uh, let's save that next mask. And one thing I do want to talk about is the fact that these nodes are working as sort of a timeline. So any adjustment that I make to the first mask base node in that timeline won't have any effect on the metal. So let's talk about the erase mask input. I'm going to add a new texture node and I'm going to open one of the seamless textures that comes with mask tools. I'll use the seamless paint cracks. 
Okay, so I'll plug that directly into the erase mask input and then use control T to add a mapping and texture coordinate node and then scale this texture up. Okay, now this has had the opposite effect that we want. This kept the cracks, we want to erase them. So we'll just invert the erase mask. And now we have these really fine cracks in that paint. The erase mask can be especially useful for procedural masks. In the center, we can see the erase mask. And on each side, we can see before and after it's applied. Now I'll plug a texture into the color input of the dielectric one material, because I want to add some color to this. Um, but you can see that as I paint on this, it's not affecting that metal material. So this, this really does truly act like a layer type uh, system, kind of like in 2D photo manipulation software, like GIMP or Photoshop. Okay, so I'll just put one more color on here just to finish it up. And I think I like the look of this, so I think I'm going to call it done. And you can see of the four mask-based nodes in the preset, I've only used two. So that's quite a lot of detail just from two nodes. Now let's work on the displacement. I want to switch from the EV render engine to the cycles render engine. Now I'll click on the materials tab and scroll all the way down to settings. Here I'll change the displacement type from bump only to displacement only. Then from the material shader, I'll plug the displacement right into the material output. From here, you need to make sure that you have enough geometry to displace. So I'll increase the levels on the subdivision surface modifier. Now there's a funny little issue with blending height maps. So Mask Tools has a solution for fixing it. If we control shift click through this node, we can view all of the various different maps being blended until we get to displacement. Now, height maps often have a lot of inconsistencies in its mid-range values. But fortunately, there's a slider to help even it out. So under each displacement input, there's a displacement value slider. So the goal here is to get the cobblestone to be the same value as the lowest part of that ground texture. Next, I can use the add mask to height slider, and in this case, invert it. And so ultimately these two options give me the ability to equalize those two height maps and then add extra depth with the mask. So now if we plug that displacement in, we can see that we have a nice stone path that's lower than the dirt and rocks. And this will bake out into a really nice height map. Now in the case of the shield, we're not using a lot of height maps other than the wood. So we're just going to add the mask to the height. Now when we view our material, uh, you may notice some strange artifacts around the bump or some odd shading. And this is because now that we're using physical geometry, we don't really need that bump mapping anymore. So if I turn that bump for that metal mask off, uh, you see that it, it improves quite a lot. And one way to view the displacement settings better is to go to Shift A, Input, add a Fresnel node, and then add that to a Viewer node. Now we can better see the curvature of that model and how it's being displaced. On the material shader, there's a displacement scale slider, which affects the strength of that displacement. In addition to that, there are other sliders for affecting separately the bump and the normal map. And the last thing that I'll do before baking the textures is add some ambient occlusion. So if we slide the slider all the way up, then we can affect the strength, which adds this directly to the color map. And while Blender has options for baking roughness and normal maps, for the other textures, you'll have to bake them directly from the viewer node by control shift clicking through the material shader. You even have the option to bake the ambient occlusion map separate in case you don't want to add it to the color map. You can also bake out alpha and emission maps. And when you bake out the normal map, it will apply whatever normal maps, bump detail, and displacement you have applied to your model. And once you've baked your textures, you can either apply them directly to a principled shader or a material shader. Uh, but in this case, I'd like to apply them to another mask-based node, because there's still a few options that we haven't gone over. So now I'll go back to the EV render engine, and now I can just drag these maps directly from the file browser into the shader editor, remembering to set all of the uh, metallic roughness and normal maps to non-color data. Now, with the texture work alone, we have what would be considered a very detailed game engine object if we were to reduce the geometry. But let's add the displacement map directly to a displacement modifier. 
First, I'll click New Texture, and then switch the coordinates to UV, and then under the Texture tab, I'll select that Baked Height Map. And by default, the strength is too high, so we'll take that down. And there's still some issues because the mid-level value is a bit too high, so we'll take that down as well. And now that the geometry of my model has been physically displaced, I want to add one of Mask Tool's procedural masks. So I have this set of Moss PBR textures that I, again, downloaded from uh, textures.com. I'm just going to drag these directly from the file browser and drop them into the shader editor. Now I'll go to my Mask Tool settings and select the Dust Mask. And I'll drag it over. And first, Control shift click to view it in a viewer node. Now we can take a look at some of the settings. Uh, the first thing I would like to do is add a little bit of noise to that mask. And we can affect things like the roughness, which is a new feature just added in this version. And then we can control the amount. And I think that looks pretty good. So let's add that directly to the mask input. Okay, and it doesn't show up very well because we need to increase that mask blend slider. And of course, now we can see it. And the, the dust mask does have quite a lot of range of values, so we could add that to the bump to give it some more detail. But there are a few options on the mask base node that we haven't covered yet, and those are the color blend options. So if I slide the color blend up, what it will do is lighten that moss texture and reveal some of the texture detail beneath. As you can see, the further I slide that slider up, the lighter that moss gets. And there's a second slider below that allows you to darken that texture. Although it's still revealing a lot of that texture work below, it's just multiplying the moss texture over it. So you can use both sliders together to get the right effect that you're looking for. Next, let's apply that subdivision surface and displacement modifier. And instead, we'll add a decimate modifier. Here you can reduce the number of vertices considerably in the instance that you wanted to create a large scene with a lot of detailed objects. And now the viewport speeds up considerably. So Mask Tools allows you to create this thing that would otherwise be very difficult to model or even sculpt, and in a fraction of the time. Now that you have an understanding of how the mask base node works, let's take a look at the other nodes in the add-on. There are five paint distortion masks, all of which have the same options but provide different effects. In many ways, they're very similar to the mask base node. You have two sets of PBR textures. You plug in a mask. Uh, the only thing I would recommend is using this fourth option on the falloff, which has the softest gradient around the border of the brush. Uh, but when you paint, you see that you now paint this noise effect. And you can scale it, distort it, or refine it, which means you're just growing or shrinking that effect. And that refining can also be done by just painting a darker value. So if I take this down to a really dark gray and I scale the noise texture, you can see that I can actually shrink some of this just by painting that dark value. So lighter values grow it, darker values will shrink it. Now, a lot of these options on the node are very similar to the mask based node. We can blend the color, we can add mask value. But my favorite new feature in version 1.6 is affecting the roughness of that noise. This allows you to paint some really realistic grunge effects to your models. And finally, we have some edge effects for our brushes, which are very useful for photorealistic rendering in a variety of ways, but become increasingly useful for NPR, or non-photorealistic rendering. And now it's easy to paint these tune style effects directly on a tune shaded model. Now let's talk about the next node in the add-on called the Bump Painter. The Bump Painter does exactly what the name implies. Here in the shader editor, I have my preset, and if we control shift click through these mask based nodes, we can see how those masks are layered. And here towards the end, I've added a bump painter node. So I'll type shift A and add an image texture, and I'll call this bump detail, and increase the size, and also check the 32-bit float box so that we can improve the quality of that detail. Next, I'll plug it into that mask input. And there are several ways that you can paint bump detail. Here I've downloaded a height map from textures.com, which of course is seamless. Now we could paint this map on with a stencil, uh, but I will switch it back to tiled, which is what it is set to by default. 
And next I can choose which parts of the model I wish to paint on. As you can see, I have my face selection mask enabled. Uh, so if I hover over the parts of the object that I want to paint on, I can just uh, type L, which will select them. Okay, and now I'll go into top view and I'll start painting that detail. There are a few things that determine the scale of the texture. One being the size of your brush, and the second being how far you're zoomed in. And because we've set this mapping to tiled, it will paint this seamlessly, uh, provided that we don't zoom in or out. Okay, so now we've added some bump detail with a texture, uh, and that looks okay, but let's just use the default brush now. So if I X out that texture, I'll change the curve to something more rounded. And now I'll paint directly on the texture. Uh, so what I would like to do is paint these little bolts or fasteners along the seams on this train car. And you might think that that would take a very long time, but Blender actually has a really easy tool for this. Let's first set the stroke method to line, and now we'll take the spacing up to about 200%. I also know that this detail will be very small, so I'll change the radius of the brush down to maybe 5 pixels. Now, because I've changed the stroke method to line and increased the spacing, I can just drag these lines down and it will add these little dots with spaces between them. And you can see them appearing on the model to the right. Now, this type of texture work is typically done for game assets that don't have a particularly high poly count. And so it becomes an invaluable tool if that's your workflow. However, the Bump Painter node does have some similar features that the Mask Base node has. For instance, you can add the mask to the height information. So for high poly models, it's sort of a way of pre-visualizing what your model will look like after you've baked the height map. Okay, so we've added a fair amount of detail now to our model. Let's take a look at some of the settings on the Bump Painter node. And once again, many of the settings on the Bump Painter node are very similar to those on the Mask Base node. Here we can affect the strength of the bump and also invert that bump detail. And next we have a slider called Refine Bump, which can help smooth out the edges of that bump detail. And this is especially useful in an instance like this, where I painted very small detail that might show a hard pixelated edge. So by refining it, you can smooth those edges. Next, there are value sliders, so we can either add mask value or we can just add value to the whole affected area. And adding value can really help sell the illusion of bump mapping. While a value of 1 is typically too high, a lower value can really help accent that bump detail. And you can also invert that value. And typically when you do this, you would probably want to invert the bump as well. This way you can simulate some ambient occlusion or the accumulation of dirt. Next we have a cavity detail slider. This takes into consideration the mid-range values of the bump, and then applies its own separate mask to it. So let's use this part of the model to demonstrate how this works. That height map that we used to paint that bump had a lot of mid-range value, which is why so much of that area is affected. But if we use the Adjust Cavity Detail slider, we can define which areas of that bump are affected by this mask. Now I'll duplicate the set of PBR textures for rust that I'm using to add that detail to the edges of the model, and I'll bring them over to the Bump Painter node. Now I'll plug them into the cavity inputs, and we have that rust texture applied to that cavity detail. Now we can do things like add bump to that cavity detail, we can invert the cavity detail bump, and we can even apply some noise to it to give it some more realism. To take it one step further, we can refine the noise to break it up a little, or even affect the roughness. And because the Adjust Cavity Detail slider can define the position of that mask, you can actually raise it to the highest point of that detail so that it can simulate some sort of edge wear. And so by using just the Mask Base node and the Bump Painter node together, you can get a lot of really good high quality texturing done for your models, particularly those that are used in game engines. Now there's one last node that we're going to talk about in this video, and that's the Wet Map Painter, which again does exactly what its name implies. Here we have a mask-based node with two materials separated by a mask, 
Now all of this is plugged into a wet map node and then into a material shader. Now this node only has one set of inputs, so all we need to do is create a mask. So I'll type Shift A, add a texture node, call it wet map, increase the size, check the 32-bit float box, and then plug that into the mask input. Now I'm going to create a second mask, but I'm not going to plug this into any inputs yet. Later I'll demonstrate how to use masks to customize your materials in a variety of different ways. Now in the Texture Paint workspace, I'll open up the Shader Editor so that we can see all of the options on the Wet Map Painter node. Now we'll check to make sure that we're painting on the correct texture. We're painting in a value of white, and I'll also change my falloff again to this fourth option, uh, just as we did with the Paint Distortion nodes. I find that it gives the best result. And as we paint these puddles, we can see that there's a very natural variation in roughness as it moves towards the edges. And there's also some procedural noise that distorts the shape of the puddles. Now there's a normal blend option that allows those puddles to share whatever normal maps belong to the material that you painted on. Next we have some options for affecting the overall appearance, the color and the depth of the puddles. So let's take the add color slider up and then expand these puddles a bit. Next I can change the color to better match whatever contaminant might be in that water. In this case I'm trying to closely match the color of the soil. We can also use the cloudiness slider to add a little bit more detail. And with the color turned off, we can actually just affect the depth. So if I take the depth all the way down, this looks like it's very shallow. And if I take it up, it seems much deeper. Now with depth, there would likely be some bump detail, uh, but you'll notice that that bump looks a little too smooth. So we can use the add noise slider and now it looks incredibly more realistic. And once you've added the noise, there's a slider just below that allows you to scale that noise detail. And using all of these options together really allow you to customize the look of the puddles that are in your scene. Now there are also some options for adjusting the roughness. Uh, I mentioned earlier that the roughness changes as it expands towards the edge of those puddles. But you can affect the overall roughness with the adjust roughness slider. There's also the edge drying slider that affects the roughness gradient around the edge of your mask. And just as with the mask base node, we have this contrast overlay setting. Uh, here we can use this to either leave those puddles on the surface or fill in the cracks. So in this case, I want to invert it and then adjust the overlay so that, yeah, we have those puddles just in the cracks. And this is the perfect time to talk about that second mask I created. Let's plug this directly into the contrast overlay input. And I've talked in previous videos about how masks are sort of a visual representation of math, with black being a value of zero and white being a value of one. Now if we paint on this new mask, we're basically determining where the contrast overlay effect will happen, while the rest of the texture, which is black, will remain unaffected. And this is true for any input on any node in mask tools, so it really opens up the possibilities of what can be done to customize these types of materials. And there are some more big changes coming to mask tools in a future update, so subscribe to the channel, follow me on social media, and there should be some news soon. Also give the video a like, share it with your artist friends, help me get the word out about mask tools. You can find it on the Blender Market, I'll leave a link below. Thanks for watching guys.